So for those of you on the webinar, our apologies for that. Uh, we made two announcements. If you're going to speak in the open mic session uh, after the current session, uh, starting at about 4.30, could you please uh, email a confirmation to Maya uh, as we had a couple of technical difficulties. And we would ask those speakers to limit their comments to no more than five minutes. Uh, we also have an open session tomorrow morning uh, starting at 9.30. We expect that to conclude um, uh, with a lot of flexibility somewhere between 10.30 and 11. So in this panel, we have four very experienced scientists with uh, a lot of experience in the system. Uh, the first speaker will be Brad Cavallo, who currently is the Vice President and Principal Scientist with Prima Sciences. He's worked in the system for more than 20 years, specializing in anadromous and estuarine fishery issues in California, and has obtained extensive knowledge of regulated rivers and estuaries more generally. He also has deep experience in high-level data analysis, including life cycle modeling, simulation modeling of management impacts, and the development, application, and evaluation of quantitative models for assessing both aquatic habitat and fish population dynamics. Prior to Prima Scientist, Brad worked as the environmental scientist with the California Department of Water Resources and was the lead scientist for hydropower relicensing. Our second speaker will be uh, James Anderson, who is an emeritus research professor from the School of Aquatic and Fisheries Science, CIS at the University of Washington. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of Washington, he worked at the National Institute of Oceanography in Indonesia and the Institute of Oceanographic Studies in Wormley, UK. He's more than three decades of experience looking at the effects of hydrosystems and water resource allocations on salmon and other fish species. He's conducted research and developed computer models of the migration of juvenile and adult salmon through regulated rivers and served on numerous regional and national review panels and committees pertaining to Sacramento fish. Uh, he will be followed by two speakers with the USGS, uh, Russ Perry, uh, who's well known, I think, to everyone, a research fish biolo biologist with the Western Fisheries Research Center of the USGS. His research centers on the development of fish population models and methods for estimating demographic parameters of fish population. He leads a team of scientists, biologists that tackle complex quantitative analyses in regulated rivers. He's also served as a Delta Science Fellow, and if I go off script, he's also well known for us for stepping in and helping these large synthesis activities over the line. And he's been very generous with his time over the years. And the final panelist this afternoon will be uh, John Plum. Dr. Plum is a research fisheries biologist with the USGS, Western Fisheries Research Center. His research focus on estimating demographic parameters in relation to the management of imperiled fish populations. He supervises the Snake River Field Station, a team of scientists that seek to conduct innovative research on threatened and endangered species in the lower Snake River and regulated rivers throughout the Western US. His body of work includes contribution to salmon bioenergetics and growth, as well as the assessment of fish passage structures in the Snake and Columbia River Dam system. So with that, I will turn over the floor and the mic to Greg. Thanks for being here this afternoon. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. All right, so I knew I was going to be speaking in the afternoon and everybody was going to be kind of sleepy. So I came up with uh, six points that I want to walk you through pretty quickly. And I, I deliberately worded them sort of provocatively to get your attention. Um, so it could be argued that some of these are overstated. That's fine. Um, they might be, but I think all of these are, are legitimate issues that we need to think about with regard to the biological models. We've heard a lot about the physical models and it seems like we have processes in place to be trying to make those better, uh, to test their predictions. And we need to do a lot more of that on the biological side. These buttons. 
Well, should I just use the keyboard? Oh, no, no, it's fine. It should be fine now. It just needs to be like stuck. Okay, so the first point here is to just really have an understanding of what the what the monitoring data is that we're working with. This was touched on in a couple of the earlier presentations. Um, and for a detailed treatment of this issue, I would refer you to this publication. Well, it's it's been accepted with revisions and it's been resubmitted. So I guess that makes it in revision. I'll get you a PDF of this, but it really dives into the data we have and the uncertainties with it. Um, but just to provide a quick overview, um, we don't have an estimate of egg incubation survival. What we have is an estimate of juvenile production at Red Bluff Diversion Dam, which is 60 miles downstream from the spawning area. And so to get to uh, egg survival or egg to fry survival, there's a lot of assumptions and other data that have to come into it. So we, we have an estimate of juvenile production, but not a direct estimate of egg survival. And as a consequence of that, if you're going to use our monitoring data from the field to try to model egg mortality, you have to make a big assumption. You actually have to make a number of assumptions, but the biggest one is that survival after emergence is does not vary from year to year and does not vary in particular with factors like river flow. But salmon, salmon biologists, I've yet to meet a salmon biologist in the Central Valley who thinks that's a reasonable assumption. I mean, this is a very consistent pattern that we see in rivers that the fry that you see downstream are pretty closely related to the flow that those fry experience. So right away, we have a problem that we're making an assumption that we think is probably unrealistic, that is necessary in order to model temperature-dependent egg mortality or just egg mortality generally. So <clears throat> this issue has been raised before. There was an expert panel um, from 2018 convened by the Delta Science Program, and they raised this issue as well. And we still haven't really fully addressed it. Number two, laboratory studies. There's a lot of lab work that's been done on salmon egg incubation. Um, a lot of it predates the work, the models, the temperature models that we're talking about. But the when the NIMS model came out, I'm assuming that folks have some familiarity with it, the key, key conclusion of it was, hey, the field, the field results are different than the lab results. And we think that's because the lab studies that we've been relying on have like saturated dissolved oxygen and high intergravel flow, okay? So since that time, there's been a number of lab studies that have been done that have variously looked at warmer temperatures, hypoxia, variation in flow to some degree. There's a lot to unpack here that I just don't have time to unpack, but it's worth looking at more closely. I'll just give you this one example from the Del Rio paper, I think it's from 2021, where there was a chronic treatment at 14 degrees C, both with hypoxia and with normoxia, and the survival to hatching was not great, but it was a lot higher than you would expect based on the predictions of the NIMS model. And I would add too that this is a 14 degrees C, which is actually higher than the, the temperature target of 13.3 that we used to operate to in the Sacramento River. So the NIMS model predicts 96% temperature dependent mortality for fish experiencing these conditions. And one of these is one with hypoxia. So doesn't exactly, exactly line up. And I would add too, that this is a study that had a pretty low rate of flow through the egg uh, incubation baskets, about four liters per hour, I believe. So not something the authors talk about, but so we've been trying to do this in the lab and not quite getting, I think, what we expected. New observations from the field also raise questions about the model. And Eric showed this figure earlier. So this is, and this is data the predicted egg to fry is data that we pull off a sac pass. It'll generate those estimates for you. So egg to fry survival predicted from the NIMS model and observed egg to fry survival through 2023. So pretty good relationship. There's definitely some patterns there. It's catching a lot of the variation. The R squared, 60, you know, 0.62, pretty good. 
One thing that's really interesting though, that we haven't talked about much as a group of the scientists that work up in this area is what's happened in the last couple of years. Because 2022 was a year where Reclamation pulled out all the stops to keep water temperatures as cold as they could and flows were really, really low. And we had the worst egg to fry survival we've ever had in the Sacramento River. And we have largely, folks have attributed that to thymine. And that's probably true. And there was some temperature dependent mortality according to the model for this year. So it's not like it was perfect. But then in 2023, we had kind of a more of a normal year, normal flows, still thymine deficiency and survival jumps up. So it seems like something else might be going on. The, the expert panel, the Gore et al, that had looked at this previously had suggested that there are alternative mechanisms for the pattern of juvenile production or egg to fry survival and that those should be looked at. They hadn't been looked at. We've just been modeling uh, as though temperature is the only factor that needs to be considered for explaining egg survival. So we recently conducted an analysis, model selection type analysis, looking at juvenile production index and a variety of environmental covariates to see, see what we would find. And temperature was among those. Um, the number of females obviously was a, was a big driver of this. But what the model selection found was that the best support was for flow, flow during incubation and emergence, and also the number of female spawners. Temperature came in in a competitive model, so it was definitely there. And there's definitely an interaction between flow and temperature, I, I'd expect. But this seems, seems significant. And then when you go through that same exercise of looking at observed versus predicted, you find that you actually get a better relationship, a better prediction of observed JPI with this model. Now, does this mean that flow is the, is the super driver and temperature it doesn't matter? Not at all. But it suggests that by looking at other covariates, you can start to understand what might what else might be going on out there that we need to better account for. So there's a lot of scientific literature on this whole issue. And I've highlighted some papers here that I found particularly helpful. There's a lot more, frankly, and I can make, or you guys can look this up or I can share my PDFs, whatever you would like, um, that really delve into the background of this. This is a very well-studied topic, the effect of temperature and dissolved oxygen on egg incubation. I would draw folks' attention in particular to this Geist paper. Um, Pretty relevant to the discussions we've been having about fall run. Really good experimental design. They looked at incubating um, fall run and found that they could survive within the first 40 days at about 60 degrees Fahrenheit as long as it got cold later. So that has implications for some of the fall run trade offs that we've been discussing previously. So, <clears throat> looking at data we already have, looking more closely at the scientific literature. But we also need better data for our system. And this is something that we're starting to do. Um, I think the, the USGS folks are gonna talk about this in a minute, but you can take artificial, you can take rep or eggs from, from a hatchery, build an artificial nest or red in the river, put the eggs in it, let it incubate and come back at the end, and you can directly observe survival in the river. And this is again, a standard method in the scientific literature. We did this for the first time last year with fall run. With this, with this kind of an experimental design, three different locations. We also collected um, inner gravel condition data, at least at a core scale point measurements. Um, we're doing this again this year. And one of the things we're gonna do is we're gonna actually put incubation chambers in the deep water upstream of ACID Dam. That was Eric mentioned that earlier, and I agree with him that that deep gravel, um, it's good gravel because it's a gravel injection site. So it's probably some of the best gravel in the river, but it's very deep. The fish are attracted to it, they're spawning on it, but the flows, the velocities are low down there. And it may be when flows are low, the velocities are low enough that those fish are not incubating well. So this is a way to learn more directly about what's happening in the river. And just some results from last year. We, you know, we are seeing quite a bit of variation between the different sites and egg incubation success. 
So lastly, just to roll up here, temperature, DO, gravel quality, river flow, these are all things that matter that we expect to be in influencing egg incubation survival. We need to do more to try and account for these things. Um, there's multiple lines of evidence suggesting that the temperature dependent mortality estimate, which again is a model derived estimate, not anything that we actually can see, seems to be missing something. So the request of the panel, um, for me at least, to the extent you have bandwidth and, and a willingness to look closely at these issues, and if you agree to convey some support for that, because it's been it's been a slow slow start to getting these additional studies going over the last six or seven years. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. I'm going to take the mic. Well, thank you, Brad, for that presentation. And now we're going to switch to uh, Dr. Anderson. I'm not sure uh, if you're with us. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Can we bring him up on the screen? Okay, I will share my screen with you. You cannot share a screen while the other participants just, share. We're just bringing you up. Can you do that? Okay. Um, tell me to take a picture. Okay, okay. Picture. so you should be able to share your screen now. Okay. Okay, so you can see this, I am assuming that we can see it well, you might want to put it, okay, now now you're in projection mode, so please go ahead, Jim. Is, is that good or should I get it back too? No, that's, that's absolutely perfect, and you're coming through very clearly on the audio too. Okay, so uh, thanks for inviting me, I found this to be really really useful, particularly Brad's presentation. Any me time to talk about uh, temperature and egg survival is, uh, is something that's of great interest, I think, to many of us. So I've been on panels for a couple of decades. And so I, I was thought I would uh, take the perspective of what, from the panel's perspective of, of what might be of use to you people uh, because there's a lot of a lot of tasks to assess what's happened to the uh, to the research and the management over the last decade, understanding what's going on today, and then making some projections or or identifying highlights that might be important for people to think about in the future. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the future, uh, but I'm going to do it through the context of uh, our egg mortality model, the SEC pass model. And so let's, this is a, then a, a short and narrow story to look at the past, the present, and the future of Shasta water and salmon. Uh, the thing about, about temperature and eggs, it is the critical window that these fish have evolved uh, a strategy to survive in the Central Valley because many parts of the year, many air, areas of the valley, uh, it's just too hot for the fish. So winter Chinook have a particularly uh, a unique situation. They had a nice uh, survival strategy in uh, the McLeod River and then the dams were built and they picked the fish up and they put them down in the, in the, in the valley and they said, okay, we will give them the temperature that they experienced up above by controlling uh, Chasta Reservoir. And to a degree that's worked, we still have salmon there. And so what I want to do is, is look at the perspective of panels and the research in a longer term uh, framework of how climate has changed uh, over the last century. And then go forward and how we think how climate might be changing in the future and how that uh, might be important for 
for reassessing what's important for the panel to consider as they make their recommendations. So <clears throat> I grabbed two things. Uh, one is the California average temperature and the other is the Palmer drought index going from 1895 up to last year. And I <clears throat> put on this, the some of the major uh, review committees have come along. Uh, CalFed started in the uh, mid 19 or in the 1990s. Uh, I was heavily involved in some of the panels back then. Uh, I was involved in an NRC panel in two, that came out with this, with its publication in 2012. So now uh, the the point I want to make is I think the or the which impacted me as I was uh, looking at what to say uh, to the panel is that things have changed since these earlier. Uh, panels and committees. So, and the most important uh, striking thing is the temperature has gone up a lot over the last 20 years. We've had very warm years and the projections are going to continue to have very, very warm years. If you look down in the, uh, uh, in the drought index, you see we've had a lot of dry years in the last three to four to five decades, more so than we've had wet years. Although certainly, certainly the last two years are an exception to that. So what I want to do is look at right now, using our SACPASS model, what is the, what does that say about the chance to operations on survival of the eggs? So I'm going to use the SACPASS fish model. It's got a lot of details in it. It's accessible through the web and you can run scenarios to uh, look at past conditions or put in components uh, to project what you think it, it would look like in the future. So <clears throat> I just want to show you the results from a model for 2021. And the reason I selected that year is because it had a very, uh, uh, it was a warm and low water year. <clears throat> and the strategy in that year was to keep the temperature as high as possible up until the point that the eggs, uh, <clears throat> that the spawning began. Now, th the way this graph works, this is Keswick temperature. Can you see the, the pointer moving on this? Yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> so that's the Keswick temperature uh, that was observed. Uh, the blue right here is uh, indication of uh, reds being occupied. The green is uh, reds that are hatching and the, or post hatching, and the uh, orange is the reds which are hatching at a particular time. So we've got th three conditions right here. And uh, what we're concerned with is mortality. We have two models, we call them the Martin model and the Anderson model, but one is the stage independent model and stage dependent mortality models. The independent mortality model, all mortality occurs at incubation. Let me back up from the beginning. <clears throat> and, oops. Okay, and that covers this whole period. So we're assuming that fish are going to die anywhere that there are fish in the reds. And the hatching mortality model assumes that uh, fish are going to die only during the period that they're hatching. And uh, Elisa showed uh, some data which uh, demonstrate the importance of uh, oxygen consumption at hatch makes them very vulnerable to temperature. So this is the way the model was run in that year. <clears throat> and basically, at the beginning of the hatch, and this is a, a strategy which works with the uncertainties of how you how water is managed. If you know when, if you have information when the first hatch is occurring, then they lower the water temperature, and they got it below what uh, the model suggested was a critical temperature, twelve degrees centigrade. If you get below that, you're going to have a lower amount of mortality, and then they held that as long as they could, <clears throat> and then after most of the hatching had occurred, they ran out of water and the, the temperature rose and then uh, 
it started cooling as the uh, as the winter came on. So we can do with the the sec pass model. We can run an alternative for how that might work. Now notice also that the temperature reached fifty four degrees. And there was twenty five percent thermal survival and four percent total survival from the uh, predicted from the model down to Red Bluff. So if mortality occurs at hatching, then we might want to try this other strategy where instead of dropping the temperature uh, at the beginning in June, we wait until July because that's when we believe that the hatching is beginning, will begin to occur. So that there we, if we haven't use the cold water earlier in the month of June, it gives us more cold water to use in July and August. And so this is an example. I ran this yesterday to produce this type of, of temperature curve. <clears throat> and you get two results depending on what you think the assumptions were for the critical window. If the critical window was the entire incubation period, there would be 15% uh, Temperature dependent mortality compared to 25% if you had if you had put the warmer water over the entire period. But if hatching is a critical window, the survival would have gone up to 58%. So there is a, a significant uh, benefit if the critical window is at hatching and not the entire incubation period. So there can be some efficiencies if that assumption holds. So that says that optimizing Shasta operations in warm, dry years is, might be a way to improve the um, survival through Shasta management. But what about the future? And so let's, let's take and use that model again, because what a model is, is really a time machine that tells you uh, the past, present, and the future. So we hop into the old SAC pass time machine, and we're going to then go forward and model some future events. So this is the <clears throat> three panels of, of significance in the, in the early 2000, 2010, and right now 2024. So let's do a projection of <clears throat> this temperature pattern that we've seen over the last two decades and, and project that out into the uh, into mid-century. And so I'm assuming that in the future, there will be panels, uh, two more panels at least over the century as they assess what uh, the impacts and where, <clears throat> uh, and where we might want to go, where the community might want to go forward uh, with. And so what I've done is projected a temperature increase and uh, the same types of drought, uh, wet, or the same Palmer index that we've had over the last 20 years. Now, <clears throat> in, in relevant thing to me is that these earlier panels, things were, we didn't see this increase in temperature, but we're now in a situation where we're projecting for very large temperature increases. So a main point that I, that I, uh, I'd uh, like to emphasize one that was uh, I emphasized to myself is we have a different time frame and a, and a different uh, imperative uh, to looking at how things are going to change and, and, and adapt to a rapidly changing future. So what I did was I ran what would be the temperature of the 2021 in if we had the same conditions in 2037, except that we had increased uh, temperature, same type of drought conditions. So I'm assuming in that year, this black line right here, that we could not get to that 24 degree temperature and the pool um, amount of cold water only allowed us to get to 55 degrees uh, temperature over that period. And what the model then projects is a thermal survival of 6% and a total survival of 1%. Because the 12 degrees in that model, 12 degrees centigrade in the model is that th critical threshold point. If you're below it, there's gonna be lower survival 
lower mortality to get above it, there's going to be higher mortality. So that's a, a characteristic and a, and, uh, and a challenge with temperature management is that we appear to be at that threshold where temperature uh, and all the associated elements that go with that can have a greater impact in survival. So let's go forward to 2055. And now I'm assuming that the temperature uh, that we could maintain uh, Shasta uh, or <clears throat> the red pools would be 57 degrees, uh, bumped it up another two degrees in that case. And the thermal survival is 2% and the total survival is a half percent. If, if we, one of the factors, one of the takeaways from this, the critical window assumption may not be important for optimizing Shasta operations under the future, or may be important for, for, op, for, for optimizing the Shasta operations in the new normal. That would be years when we're gonna have some water, but it's not gonna be a real drought year. It also says that in uh, those these high, these hot, these dry and hot years, uh, the models do not predict uh, the, the, the assumptions on critical thermal uh, uh, window don't affect the model output. Both models project very bad survivals under dry and, and very hot years. So just coming back, this is my last slide. To summarize these points, since the early 90s, we've had these, these, these committees that have, that have been formed to project and highlight important things to consider in the future. And we're right here in 2025 in these in future committees, uh, it's going to be a very different condition than we're under the under the status of we know that the that the temperature is changing and we will notice even more uh, certainly in the, uh, in the in the coming decades. So if we have five percent survival in a, a year uh, currently is in the worst case conditions, the one percent survival in about a decade, a decade and a half, a half percent of survival <clears throat> uh, by mid-century. That we we have a situation where we, sh I believe, we should be concerned with not only uh, getting better information on and ways to monitor the stocks, but begin to think about, think of strategies of what we're going to do over the century and, and extend out our time frame a little further than we have in, 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 in previous planning and accelerate the need to, to make uh, decisions quickly and, uh, uh, and in, a, in, a, in a realistic manner. So I think my challenge is, you know, I would hope that the committee uh, could consider uh, the environment that we now have uh, as they consider uh, what's important and, and, and identify ways that we can better adapt to this uh, rapidly changing environment. So that's, that's my, those are my thoughts. Well, that's great. Yeah, well, thanks for that, and thanks for the hot off the press model simulations too. Um, what, what we're going to do is we'll turn to uh, Dr. Perry and Dr. Plum, and then uh, if we have time, we'll come back for some questions from the committee. So if you could stay online, and yes, go yes. to. I have to figure out how to release you now. <laughs> Hopefully, Maya will be able to work some magic. Um, let's see if we have Russ. Good. Okay, you 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 have the the con back. Hey everyone, I'm uh, Russell Perry. I'm a research fish biologist with the USGS Western Fisheries Research Center, and I'm just going to talk for a few minutes um, and then hand it over to John. But I just first wanted to talk about um, the work that my team does. I lead the quantitative ecology section at. Uh, Western Fisheries, and uh, we've worked in the Central Valley um, for a long time. Um, our center is a, does a lot of work in acoustic telemetry, and our role has to develop, been to develop the statistical models to um, estimate uh, survival and migration 
parameters for juvenile salmon. So we've worked a lot in the Delta to develop those models to look at uh, travel time, routing, and survival of juvenile salmon in the Delta and how water management actions, environmental conditions such as flow and temperature have um, affected those demographic parameters. Um, those, that information has been used, I think, quite extensively in uh, some of the water management decisions and biological opinions that have been done. Um, we then also, Josh was talking a lot about the acoustic um, real-time telemetry website that's up and studies that are done. We have then use our, the models that we've developed to uh, generate daily predictions of survival through the Delta for a winter run and a late fall, late fall run Chinook salmon. And then Josh also mentioned, we also are uh, implementing some of the recommendations in the, in the sale publication that came out um, talking about recommendations for monitoring. So we are just wrapping up a five-year field study that was conducted to estimate efficiencies of the Chips Island trawl and then to fold into that uh, genetic uh, sampling to generate abundance estimates of uh, winter run Chinook salmon. And then moving on to the, um, you know, to the, to this review here, um, we've been working actually for quite a few years with uh, Reclamation, maybe two or three years to get a, a project in place to uh, estimate demographic parameters of um, winter run and other runs uh, using other technologies um, that allow us to get down to smaller fish like, like bit tags. And so, um, so John's gonna talk about um, that as well as trying to um, conduct field studies in the Upper Sacramento to uh, partition the survival that Brad talked about uh, from basically from, you know, spawner to fry at Red Bluff Diversion Dam. Um, so we've got a, we're in the planning stages of a multi-year study to uh, estimate um, egg survival in the Upper Sacramento and um, with that, I think I can hand it over to John to share a few slides with you about this study that um, we are collaborating with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on to implement um, in the Upper Sacramento. Great. Well, thanks and welcome, John. And if you could keep your comments to about 10 minutes, uh, that would be great. You're on mute, John. Thanks, Russ. Um, thanks. Uh, I'll just share my screen here. So yeah, this is a, we have a six person team. Um, I, I guess I should introduce myself, John Plum. I'm a colleague of Russell's. I work up here in, in Washington at the Columbia River Research Lab or the Western Fisheries Research Center. Um, and we have a six person team that seeks to partition egg and fry survival of winter run in the upper Sacramento. And Russ and I are representing USGS, uh, Craig Fleming and Brian Mathias are representing Fish and Wildlife Service. And Alex Vazel and Joshua Israel are with the Bureau, Bureau of Reclamation. Um, so I'm just going to give a 10,000 foot view of, of our study. And here we have a 10,000 foot view of our study area. The, it's going to extend from Keswick Dam down to about Cow Creek. And we want to basically divide this section of river into 10 sites. Um, so that we can get the spatial gradient and temperature and how it affects egg survival. Um, the red dots here in the map are 10 years of winter run red locations. Um, a little bit about the scope of the study. Yeah, we want to really capture that spatial gradient up as you move downstream from Keswick Dam. As you know, the compliance point is at Clear Creek. Um, and we want to set up a number of sites around there to help capture that temperature threshold as you move away from the dam um, in terms of on egg red survival or egg survival. Um, another component and scope of the study is temporal and variation, where we want to get egg survival at the beginning of the run timing and towards the end of the run timings so that we also get that seasonal change in temperature and flow 
in the egg survival estimates. And we're going to be conducting the study for the next four years, so we'll be able to get some idea of the interannual variation in conditions and egg survival. Um, just really quickly, we're going to install artificial reds. It's a two-day process where we go out one day and we construct the red, put in a standpipe to hold the gravel in place. Um, on day two, we go out with the eggs in the milk, fertilize the eggs on site, put them in the egg boxes, um, put in our oxygen temperature sensors, pull that stand pipe and the gravel collapses down around it. And then we'll wait until the hatching stage um, to pull the egg boxes and estimate the uh, subsequent egg survival. Some of the measured factors we're gonna account for and measure are parentage. Um, of course, the, the usuals of location, date, and depth of the red. Um, at the end of the study, we'll, we plan to look at the percent of yolk sac remaining in the eggs to get an idea of what, what developmental stage the mortality occurred, and also developmental indices on the emerging fry. Um, we do have sensors in each red, and we'll be measuring dissolved oxygen temperature in each red on a five minute, five minute interval. Uh, we also want to estimate prevent, pre present signs and cobble characteristics of each red. And then of course, link those to dam operations and river discharge at the time. Uh, another thing we're going to try to use are scour chains, which will give us an idea of red disturbance and also help us find our reds after the incubation period has occurred. In terms of sample sizes, we're going to use 10,000 eggs annually um, with 100 eggs per red using three milliliters of milk for 100 eggs. Uh, we're gonna have five reds at each of our 10 sites as we move downstream from the dam. And then we're gonna capture two spawning periods or two incubation periods uh, during the early and late part of the spawn time. And we wanna, there's still some um, uncertainty on when we're gonna um, check the eggs and pull the, pull the boxes and estimate survival. Um, you know, the hatching stage has been identified as an important stage and we're trying to get a good handle on what amount of accumulated thermal units that will occur. But at some point we will standardize the accumulated thermal units and pull our egg boxes at that standardized time. Um, a little bit on the project schedule. As I mentioned, it's a five-year study. This year is the implementation study where we're just getting our ducks in a row and getting ready to put artificial reds in 2025. Um, we're, annually, we're gonna put data releases out to the public and we're gonna have an interim report in 2026 and a final report in 2028. And with that, um, it's all our project. I'll open it up to questions. It's great, well, thank you, John. For, um, being so concise and getting so much information out quickly, we appreciate that. Um, so that's the end of the introductory remarks by panelists. So now we'll open the floor for any questions from the committee to anything you've heard from these um, scientists. Especially with the walking mic, Maria, that's just on the battery's last. Okay. Uh, just a brief uh, question for you, Brad. When you were looking at the uh, multiple regression model, did you uh, do, use anything like test or DNC or anything like that to see what the different contributions were to the overall model? I'd be curious to see what some of the ones, because when you were modifying the model, it really happened in two points and not so much the slope. So, yeah, you, you, you have that available. Yeah. I guess everybody heard the question, but it was about uh, more details on the model selection and evaluation process. And we have them right up there, so I'll share that. Questions from the committee? Thank you very much. I really appreciate the uh, discussion of climate change and how the temperature was increasing. And I've noticed that my committee members keep asking uh, agency staff about that. 
and the agency staff uh, describe their efforts to get through the year. And, and it, it does give me uh, sort of a, a fear that we're, the staff is busy organizing the chairs on the Titanic and not realizing that disaster is around the corner. Um, is there something going on that I don't understand that the agency staff don't resonate more with the question is what's your vision are going to be of the salmon in 10 years? Yeah, I'm not sure which of the panels. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So, uh, Brad suggested that perhaps uh, Russ and I, I'm joking. So, for, for the folks joining online, um, you know, I'm not sure if uh, Jim, you touched on the climate issue, whether you want to start. Okay. Uh, we 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 talked a lot uh, at CBR about how do we prepare for the future? How do we and what are the implements or the impediments impediments to to making better plans for the future? And I I think your uh, your your question really uh, sets that up. Is there are so many daily tasks that are needed by the staff that the staff must conduct to, to run uh, a year, that there's hardly any time to do any of this long-term planning. Uh, and so one of the things we thought that might be of value is to somehow identify what things are important to, to uh, and what things can be, can be put back to a, a lower priority or uh, not be uh, attended to on a, on a regular basis. Uh, Josh Israel and I talked about this a, a number of years ago when we tried to, through SatPass, develop particular websites for the working group. So they would not have to bring the information together. It could be available to them from our website where they could make those those uh, uh, those meetings. So the, the basic idea is, is 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 how can we how can the staff and the, and the scientists in the in the region uh, free up more time to to have some long term planning? Thanks, Kevin. I'm not sure if Russell John obviously the USGS thinks a lot about climate in the future. Uh, did you have Russell, John, did you want to add to that? No, I mean, the only thing I'll say is that our goal here is to see if we can, um, you know, look at trends in um, egg survival, you know, from this experimental design that would help support or uh, guide either the existing or future models and, you know, potentially um, also climate change. So, you know, is the empirical evidence that we see when we conduct this study, you know, consistent with the models and consistent with what, um, you know, some of the work that uh, Jim has shown in terms of the trends. So I don't think we have anything directly to say with respect to the work that we're doing on climate change, except that to help support of the models that are being um, constructed. Thanks, Russ. Right, can I have a final word on that question? Well, I just want to add that um, it's not just about freshwater management. Um, one of the things that we could do that would help a lot would be to try to manage for more diversity and age of maturity of these fish. Um, we don't know a lot about what winter run Chinook salmon, when they used to return to spawn. But uh, fall and spring run, it appear that a lot of them used to mature at age four, five, even six. And right now we have most of our fish maturing at age three. There's still, for winter run, there were still a few are age four fish around. It's hard to be a late maturing fish off the coast of California due to very intense ocean fishery. Uh, but we do a pretty good job of protecting the fish that are going to mature early, but the fish that mature late get hit. And so if we want to have a population that's more resilient to drought and climate change, we really need to try to have fish mature. How do they respond to that? 
my feeling is we probably will not have winter Chinook in the Central Valley uh, by the end, by mid-century. And the fact that uh, there are efforts to get those fish up to McLeod, I think is a very practical uh, approach to dealing with uh, what the real changes of climate are going, the real challenges that climate are going to bring to the community. Okay, thanks, Chair Monday. We've got one more question um, before the next session. So, Dr. Lee. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, you know, I just uh, whispered to Renee sitting next to me when um, when I was hearing some of these presentations about I can't believe we're actually out there really measuring things in the reds. You know, we're finally out there putting some eggs in and putting some sensors in. It's great. Um, and they're all going to say fuck, right? Because I, I really do think it's great and, and I'm really looking forward to seeing those results. Um, I, I am struck by, um, you know, the presentation that we had early from, earlier from Randy on the development of the temperature modeling platform and the major collaborative effort that was involved in that and how getting everybody around the table and kind of you know, co-designing it seems like a, a key part of this. And I'm, I'm a little concerned that we've got two kind of parallel efforts going on here. Brad having described an experimental design on the same stretch of river, pretty much the same as the one that John described. Um, and I'm wondering where there are maybe some broader opportunities for fostering collaboration there and, um, you know, sharing and aligning and, and making more of two individual studies uh, there. The other thing about them is is whether or not whether or not these field studies are really linked into any kind of modeling framework that is explicitly going to allow us to utilize uh, those results that we have some some um, predictions um, about the characteristics of the in, of the uh, of the reds and the gravel and where we're putting things that we're really trying to test like what's the What's the um the kind of what are the research questions there um that we that we're that we're trying to get at? Um or are we really just trying to refine, you know, that the the temperature threshold in the existing models? I'm just wondering where the where this is gonna go when we've got this data. Um I would like to go to first. Did you want to go first, Russ, and then we'll try Jim? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd just like to say that some of the, it is going to be challenging. I mean, Eric um, Ganner, who's still in the room, I presume, um, has been, we've been in conversations with Eric and he's been very upfront about um, where measurements of oxygen and velocity matter and that's at the you know the that's at the you know the egg membrane interface and the interstitial zone uh, between the eggs and they've done some great modeling so i don't think we are going to be able to measure those characteristics at that level i don't think the the um basically the the sensors available for modeling that um and measuring that are not available to measure them at that level. But what we can do, I think, is to look at what we're focusing on are, you know, trends and gradients in the egg survival in these egg boxes that can be predicted from those models so that we can look at, you know, large scale management factors of things we can control like flow and uh, sometimes water temperature and see if we can uh, generate the relationships and make a link between the and basically the empirical data and the uh, mechanistic process-based models, essentially. Thank you, Russ. So we'll go to, you know, to Jim and then John and then Brad, you can have the last word. Okay. Uh, I think the, I think this is all really, Really wonderful work. The uh, just just to point out the both the Martin and the Anderson models 
uh, are the years that influence temperature, there's only very few. There's maybe four or five years. So everything is being is being produced by those particular years. Neither of those models has a flow component to them. It's assuming the background mortality is, is constant every year. And that's just wrong, of course. But we we were fitting the data so well in both those models that it didn't seem at the time that it was worthwhile to do the extra work. So going forward with, with improved models and improved data to that, I think two questions to be asked are to, uh, one is, what do we what do we get out of more information, or what information can we include in the existing models that are going to improve the, the uh, produce the fit that you showed, Brad, in, in your uh, presentation? Uh, so if we can get a better fit by just adding flow into that, let's do that, uh, and then let's go back and think about uh, whether or not we've explained enough. Uh, the other thing is, if we look forward in 10 and 20 years, if we have a better idea of what are the thresholds for control of mortality, the oxygen and temperature thresholds, are they going to help us in 10 years from now in managing those, these fish? And I think we have the tools today to uh, make a first order stab at that. And I, I did that over a days of analysis, which I presented to you. And I think as we go forward, we should really ask, what is this information going to help us uh, through the rest, through the first half of this century? And if not, we should really plan alternatives. Um, maybe it's getting these fish into different areas, or maybe it's finding ways or, or mechanisms to triage uh, some of these stocks. So we, we've focus our limited time and resources on the stocks that we think are most sustainable in the valley. Thank, thank you, Jim. And uh, John, I'm not sure John's the world is yet. So John, do you have anything to add? Um, the only thing I would say about our study is that it, like Russell had mentioned, we probably won't be able to estimate what actual egg mortality is, but we can at least index it to the things that are important for management. Um, you know, we wouldn't, I don't think we should expect our estimates to really match model predictions. Um, just simply having the eggs in a cage, they're not subject to predation um, and those kinds of things. So I don't think we'll actually get a real good estimate of what egg mortality was, but I think we can really index it to management. I mean, I also like to say that we are really reaching out collaboratively. I spent last week down in Redding with California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Pacific States Marine Fisheries Commission on red surveys. Um, I reached out to Steve Zuig, but he wasn't in the area at the time. And also, so this is really a collaborative project. It's not being done um, independently. Independently. That's all. Thanks. Brad, do you have a final word if you have anything to add? Well, part of what I just say was to just affirm what John already said that we have been coordinating. What we did last year was very much a concept of paper connection through this. Um, and the experiment, experimental design that John talked about is a lot more extensive. Um, I agree that it's, I think it will have a lot of value um, just getting these data from the field from some of the figures that we saw earlier. I think it was Alyssa's presentation. There's a lot of variation in. Uh, egg to fry survival that we don't isn't attributable attributable to anything, um, but in a lot of cases, I mean, if we if we're um, if we're having the eggs incubate at some temperature, and we would expect from the existing temperature models that they all die, and we find that they they didn't die, but they hatch successfully. That tells us something useful, you know, maybe not enough to calibrate the model. But the other thing I would add too is from the 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 field, the lab studies. I don't think we really figured out how to study this in the lab either. Um, the conditions in, in the bread where the eggs are incubating, 
our, the water is not moving quickly, but it's also not a static environment. It's really dynamic. There's pressure changes. Uh, you know, if you've been on the river, there's waves. The flows go up and down at least a little bit. There's other fish digging red. So it's not just a static, super low flow. And so I'm not sure the boundary layer, super low flow conditions that we've looked at are exactly right. And even though we have what I what I see in the study results, and this would be a great thing to discuss, is that when velocities, intergravel velocity, steady state are really low, eggs do bad regardless of temperature. And when they're a little faster, there's definitely an effect like colder is better, but it still doesn't quite fit what we've seen with the the, the NIMS model. So Okay, well, thanks, Brad, and uh, let's just give the panelists another round of applause. Thank you. Uh, it's on our electronic list. It appears there's uh, been a merger of two lists, so we've got a very long list of folks here who may or may not want to say anything. I think some people uh, were just recognizing that they were here and adding to our attendee list. So what I'll do is ca call out the list of names as they came in. If you don't wish to say anything, don't feel under any your obligation. Um, and uh, I would just ask folks to perhaps uh, limit their comments to maybe two or three minutes if we can get through through the list. So, so, yeah. so, so we're not sure which is which. There were, there were two sign up lists, and we're not sure who, who signed up on one. So, um, the first one, Cassandra Cole. Um, not sure if you were just a, a, a attendee or like. So, Cassandra, yeah, please come up and here's, here's the mic. Might want to stand here out of the glare of the. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for allowing us to um, attend your meeting. Thank you to the panelists and all the committee. I am a one among one two tribe member. And a descendant of Lala and West Curl, who were both born on the Cloud River. I apologize. I just wanted to take a moment to recognize that we are in Wintu territory. Um, I believe that this is, uh, if you were to go outside just right over to the river, it was original um, Donom ancestral homeland. Um, so just wanted to take a moment to recognize that and some of you may not know that this was tribal territory, so welcome. I just wanted to quickly read a poem that I had written and also um, a shout out to Rachel. She shared a painting during her presentation earlier and it's a direct um, direct correlation. It's about the uh, tribes along the river lighting fires to help guide them back up to where they need to spawn. So the name of my poem is Nur by Fire. Nur is what our Wintu word for salmon. In the frigid snow melt, life begins and ends. A long purposeful journey felt in every scale and fen. Navigating downriver hundreds of miles to go on their path to the ocean, it's the only way they know. Following the songs of the people, and the map of the stars, the vibration from drums and dancing provides proof they know where they are. Our ancestors had a connection that our hearts cry for today. We sing, dance, and speak for them, and at ceremonial fires we pray. The health of the river and all that it connects can be felt throughout villages and all those who share respect. From the top of the mountains, our spirits call with desire to lead our relatives home by the light of our fires. Thank you again. Well, 
thank you, Cassandra. And if you're willing to share that poem with us, I think we would uh, really appreciate that. Uh, I'm just running through the list here as they appear. Uh, the, the next speaker, and perhaps I could also ask just to say who you're affiliated with, as Cassandra did a moment ago, uh, Deirdre Desjardins. Uh, you're next, and I believe you're online. Oh, whoops, sorry. Thank you. I wanted to uh, point out that although it's bad news about the uh, warming in uh, the watersheds, uh, and that makes it much more challenging to keep cold water fish like salmon uh, pop populations viable. Uh, there is some good news. There's some new state-of-the-art climate modeling um, with a very high-resolution version of the community earth system model. And it shows that the drying trend in the Southwest um, and across Western North America that we've seen in the past decade could reverse um, sometime in the next few decades. There's actually, the new modeling shows forcing towards a warm Pacific to cattle oscillation period and a more El Nino-like climate. And it would be warmer, but it would also be significantly wetter. Uh, El Nino-like warm PDO periods have been pluvials, where uh, it's significantly wetter than the 20th century climatology. So while it's challenging to keep salmon populations alive, there's a possibility that there might be significantly more water. And um, in that case, water management in the reservoirs is going to be critical. And I wanted to point out, it's not just a within-year management. Carryover storage is the buffer between wet years and dry years. And management of carryover storage is absolutely critical for climate change. And there has been a delay in in considering ways to, to take less risk with carryover storage and, and to really manage carryover storage for in-basin needs, including cold water pool. Um, there is a conflict with Delta exports in doing so, um, but the result is not only a more reliable water supply for environment and in-basin needs and salmon, but also a more reliable water supply uh, that doesn't go between boom and almost no almost nothing as we've seen uh, the past decade. So I will get you this. It's um, very current new research. Um, it's headed uh, by Robert Jinglin Wills and a group of scientists who've been doing research on the pattern effect, which is uh, the cool pattern of sea surface temperatures in the Eastern Pacific, the La Nina-like pattern we've seen in recent decades. Um, and it's very important for equilibrium climate sensitivity and how much warming we might get. And it's also incredibly important for Western hydroclimate and, and for understanding climate shifts that we've seen in the 21st century and that we might see in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, let's see, the next speaker we have is Kevin Howard. Good to see you, Kevin. If you want to come and use, use the mic, please. So, and the next speaker will be Regina if you want to come up so we can do a quick transition. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank all of the speakers that, that we've had today. Um, you know, there's just a lot of great work going on out there and 
particularly in the area of uh, modeling and tools. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to, to really emphasize is the fact that it seems like there are, are so many different tools out there and so much different modeling going on that um, there's a real need for being able to tie these things together. Um, I, I really liked the, the co-equal uh, model, the WTMP modeling efforts, where they're really focused on optimizing many, many variables. Because the operation of the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project is such a complex system that uh, there just really has to be better uh, you know, collaboration in this area. And so uh, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Kevin Howard, and I'm from Northern California Power Agency. And uh, our members um, get about 40% of the federal hydropower from the Central Valley Project. And so um, the hydropower is a very, very important as a clean, um, affordable, and reliable product for the state. And so the power uh, customers, as well as Western Area Power Administration and Bureau of Reclamation, have really been focused on improving our modeling as well, uh, modeling and forecasting to kind of integrate water operations with power operations. And, um, you know, so we're interested in also participating along with the, you know, the rest of the stakeholders in this process to help optimize all of these, you know, all these factors. Uh, so for a couple of, of examples that I think could be very mutually beneficial, um, the way that the system is configured, there is the opportunity to divert water from the, the Trinity side of, of uh, the system over to the Sacramento side. And as you heard today, you know, there's a colder water pool over on the Trinity side. And so there's a lot of opportunity to be able to optimize by, by maybe moving some of those diversions, the ones that can come over anyway, at a time of year where it can optimize the cold water pool in uh, the Shasta side, while at the same time, it's beneficial to the power because um, as uh, I, I don't know how familiar everybody is with the uh, power in California, but there's something known as the duck. So basically, during any given day, there's a peak in the morning for power, and then solar generation comes in, and there's a belly of the duck where there's not very much uh, power needed because there's so much solar in. And then when the sun goes down, it really peaks in the evening hours. And, um, you know, people are getting home, turning on their air conditioners, and the value of the energy is so much more at that time of day. And so it's it's very important to be able to have that hydropower as a, as a resource uh, during that time, time frame. And if it's unable to be utilized during that time frame, what gets filled in is, is uh, fossil fuel generation. And so... There's another environmental risk here uh, related to emissions. And so um, I shared a, a model that the power uh, folks have put together with, with Jerry and, and Laura. And um, we'd really like you know, your input on, on this model because essentially there's, there's an environmental impact from not being able to generate this clean hydropower. So uh, another, uh, Example is as well that I think I'd like the, the committee to look at is the the difference between fall releases and carryover water into the system. We've heard so much about cold water pool management, and one thing that that I think is worth looking at is in detail is how much you carry over into the next the next year to preserve cold water pool management. So, um, and, and then the final comment that I'll make is that the operators really need tools to optimize, you know, how to operate this system. And so, you know, kind of melding all of these models together and actually having something that can, can help operators make quick decisions is very, very important. So 
anyway, again, thank you for your time and thanks for all you presented today. Thank you, Kevin. Hello. Um, hi, my name is Regina Chigazola. I'm with Safe California Salmon. Um, I do not have a PhD, but I do have um, 25 years of experience working on water quality issues and salmon issues, primarily within the climate and Trinity systems, but also within the Bay Delta and Sacramento system. Um, and before I start with the comments I prepared, I just want to um, clarify um, this Trinity cold water pool issue. Um, the Trinity River is diverted through a series of um, dams and then into Whiskey Town. And by the time that water does hit the Sacramento system, it actually warms the Sacramento River. Um, and a lot of times when those diversions happen to try to cool down the Sacramento system, it actually harms water quality um, because it is moved so many different times. Um, plus that water is critically important to the climate system. And um, we have federally recognized tribes with tribal fishing rights in, um, in the climate system. And it doesn't matter if you have rights or not, but um, you know, I just wanted to say that water is not available. Um, Actually, because of the carryover storage issues in the Trinity Reservoir, because it is so large and climate change, changing the way that the system works, um, we almost didn't have enough water to release out of the Trinity system during the last drought to stop climate river fish kills. Um, and there, that is what the cold water storage in the Trinity River is used for, is one, the Trinity River, and then two, to stop climate river fish kills of tribal trust protected species. So I just wanted to, um, Clarify that water is not actually available to cool down the Sacramento system. It would be harmful to the Sacramento and plan to um, move forward with that assumption. Um, so that's the first thing I just wanted to clarify because it keeps being brought up and um, it's important to think of the Trinity as a tributary of the planet River because that's what it is. Um, and it's also critically important to start looking at the carryover storage on the Trinity side because actually during that time where we almost didn't have water for that release, the release of Trinity water did kill um, because it got too hot due to low carryover storage to kill a lot of coho salmon about three years ago. So um, yeah, let's not try to take more from the Trinity because for two reasons. One is it's harmful to the Sacramento, two it's harmful to the Klamath, and also if anyone pays attention to us on the Klamath River, um, we put up quite a fight <laughs> and are not okay with that. So anyway, just clarifying that real quick because it keeps being brought up. Um, but my notes are on my phone. Um, so while we're thinking about um, winter run salmon and we're thinking about how to save them, there's a few things I would like to just put out there. Um, one is that I really appreciate Rachel and of course with Mungu too for trying to figure out ways to get the winter run out of this um, precarious part of the Sacramento system where obviously they're not okay. Um, we really need to think about tributaries and I know that the focus of this group is um, Shasta temperature management, um, but we do have like critical tributaries in the Sacramento system that are important to winter run that are above the Shasta Dam, but also that are important to the spring run and um, I think that a big elephant in the room that we don't want to talk about is this guarantee that we have um, these farmers that are going to get their water rights and are going to get their contract applications no matter what. But these water rights, you know, they were made in a different climate. And there's five times as much water rights, at least sometimes 10 times, that are actually allocated than exist within the system. Um, and that's when we allocated water, you know. So um, we can't continue to be like, oh, settlement contractors are gonna get 75% of their water no matter what, because it's not possible. That water is not there anymore. Um, and that's what happened during the last drought is that we put it out there that settlement contractors, exchange contractors are gonna get their water no matter what. And we allowed 98% of the eggs to die in the river. And um, we allowed the spring salmon populations to decline by, I think it's 92%. I mean, and to like, um, I have a presentation on this, but to look at the numbers, I mean, we're looking at several thousand salmon and some of these tributaries going down to 923 for spring, and numbers like that for spring salmon. 
and river management, even though that the spring salmon use these critical tributaries and we need to look at flows within these critical tributaries and temperatures, there's also real management implica implications to how we manage winter run for spring salmon. Because you know, we do have um, interbreeding of species between fall run and spring run. We have run timing getting really confusing. Um, and so I just wanted to, again, say, I really agree with um, with the different people who spoke earlier and when we went to that, we need to be able to get winter run into some real habitat. Because the way that we're managing the system is just putting everything out black, whether it's water quality in the Delta, whether or not it's spring, sun, spring run salmon, whether or not it's winter run salmon, whether or not it's fall run salmon. And like um, to put some like real numbers, because um, say California salmon represents like fish people, tribal communities, um, uh, commercial communities, but um, you know, there's a lot of talk about how it's the second year in a row that commercial fishing is shut down, and that's true. But one thing that um, isn't brought up a lot is that out of the last 10 years, commercial fishing has been shut down almost all those years or else severely restricted. Um, you know, I think there is something like, I actually have tons of numbers in front of me, but 130,000 salmon that had returned, which was down something like 65% within recent years, and this is fall run, right? So are we gonna push fall run into extinction too? Like we just pushed spring run into extinction, almost extinction, because we're only managing for one single species. Um, and of course, like, we have to save the winter run, but we have to save the winter run by, like, yeah, manage to make sure that they don't go extinct for now, but they need to get into the habitat. Same with spring run and fall run too. Um, and we need to like actually look at the real time implications and start um, talking to the people that were the most impacted like Winnemo went to, like Hoopa tribe, like the commercial fishing community, because, um, you know, we're looking at the, looking at the end of our salmon and extinction of all these species now, because of the way that we've managed just over the last drought. And of course, that's oversimplification. It's been 20 years of declines, but the last drought really pushed us into an almost extinction situation for spring run made winter run way worse and now is putting fall run into a situation where they could get a sick loss. So anyway, I know you have only certain questions in front of you and I really thank you for looking at them and thinking about all this math modeling and complicated operations at Shasta, so critically important, but also why you're doing it, please look at all the different runs of salmon, please look at the tributaries and please try to think of a more holistic way to actually save all these species and let's look at what water exists compared to what, how much water is being promised to farmers that are doing things like flood irrigating rice fields. And I know there can be multiple uses of flood irrigating rice fields if they're in floodplains. The floodplains are important, but ultimately there's uses of water that are consistent with beneficial uses in the state and consistent with keeping salmon alive, even during climate change. And then there's uses of water that are just ridiculous. And we're going to at some point have to confront that. Um, and then the last thing I would say is that if there's anywhere that does have some climate resilience, resiliency, it's some of these um, spring fed systems above Shasta and some of these spring fed systems in the east side Sierras and, um, and also like in the um, some of the upper Trinity. So um, yeah, let's look at where there is climate resistant watersheds and make sure the salmon can get there and then we start managing for all of the species and start looking at these contracts and operations in a way that it's not just, okay, we're constrained to only this much water that fish can use. I mean, why limit ourselves to be like, to say that these contracts and water rights that some of them are like from the late 1800s are set in stone when we have a new climate to work within. Hopefully that made sense. It's a lot easier when I have my presentations and thank you. Thank you, Regina. And uh, actually, I should have said we've been deeply honored uh, in the meeting today that there is a large uh, delegation from the women and uh, women to the So we really appreciate you being here. Uh, and I would just ask uh, Chief Sisk, I know you're going to be talking and addressing the group at 9.30 tomorrow. Uh, did you want to hold your personal comments until tomorrow? Or uh, we'll do that. But we are going to hear from the, the uh, several of your members who 
taken the time to be with us today. And so I'd like to go, first of all, to uh, Michelle Lent, I think. Michelle. Uh, is, is Valerie? Yeah, Valerie. Did you want to say any words to the group? No. Um, let's see who else have we got. Uh, is it Lisa Ju? Yeah. I apologize if I. That's what Richard your name. Lisa Joe. Lisa Joe. Lisa Joe. Mm -hmm. you like oh, okay. um, it wasn't lost on me, and in fact, that's why they got me up off my seat to say a few words. When the scientists uh, had uh, about two seconds of dead silence and asked about climate change, and I'm not demeaning them because it was actually the honest and uh, it is an honest response, and uh, I appreciated that. Uh, there was a moment of a heart flutter, but I want to say that I wasn't born when I went to. I did follow the tribe. I went through the public school system. I went through college. Um, and um, I learned the science where we learned about uh, rocks and water in the sixth grade. And we learned about plants in the seventh grade. And we learned about salmon in the eighth grade. And that had an effect on all of us, I believe, because it leads us to that moment where we get that heart flutter when asked, what are we doing about climate change? But I have good news. And I'd like to say, uh, I hope all of you do come at 9.30 tomorrow to listen to the chief, because I started listening to uh, indigenous peoples and, and then really uh, listen to uh, the Winneman leaders who are, um, they actually have their old traditional way of leadership. It's not by the council. They still haven't broken away from uh, the way that they were led from the very beginning of time. And I learned a lot from them. <clears throat> and so uh, I, I think it would be, well, what I wanna say is, this year, uh, well, last May, Chief and the Winnemem tribe co-signed uh, a promise with NOAA and with California Department of Fish and Wildlife to work together to restore the Chinook salmon from the hatchery in, their in the salmon's original spawning place. And they've worked since May together, maybe even before, and in working together that interface between scientists that um, went further in their studies and been at this for decades, in that interface with them and the tribe, things happen. There are ideas that open up minds and, and even beyond that, it gives you hope. And uh, so, I uh, I learned, and this is the most important thing I learned from Chief, is that salmon is a very important player in the solving of, the, of climate change. Uh, they don't have to be, uh, what I'm saying is they don't have to be managed. If we learn from them, which is how Chief learned, her teacher is salmon, uh, and we notice certain things because you were on the right track when you talked about rocks and water and salmon. Um, you learn certain things, then you know, you know, you can turn things around. I mean, we have to live like we believe that that you can learn from the salmon. You can learn with uh, the original people who work with the salmon in this territory. And we could work with our science and come together and learn more things. And it will open us up because that fish is going to lead us to a solution if we include it and if we listen and if we have faith. 
Cassandra's poem kind of talked about that. So uh, that's the good news I'm gonna bring today. That's what I learned in the last 40 years from the women in Renshaw. And uh, I keep learning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Joe, for those remarks. Um, also, do we have Marie Sis here? Okay. Well, well, that uh, I think concludes. Was there anyone else from the side wish to make remarks? Um, if not, we'll look forward to the Chief's comments tomorrow morning. The, Next person on the list here is Lisa Kassner, who will be simply reading Lisa's book here. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Thanks for being here. Um, Matt, Matt Brown? Yes, I also thought it might be good thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. So perhaps we'll go back onto the on online participants again. Uh, Stephen Zhu, if I'm pronouncing that right, with Frame of Fish Sciences. Uh, Stephen, did you wish to say anything? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's see. Okay. Uh, can you yeah, can you hear? Can, can you hear me? We we can hear you very well. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. My name's uh, Steve Zoig. I'm a a fish ecologist with Kramer Fish Sciences. I've been working in the Valley on salmon issues for about 20 years and done some work with Winter Run. I'm leading the egg to fry survival study on the Sacramento River. And uh, a, one thing I was really heartened to see was in uh, Randy's presentation on uh, the characterization and reporting of uncertainty in the physical models. And I think that's something that we're, we're lacking in the biological models. Uh, in, all, in both of both the Anderson and the, the NIMS model, um, there's all the, the data used to construct those models is, is highly uncertain and there's multiple estimates used to construct it, but those confidence intervals are not propagated all the way through to the estimates. This is something that came out in the 2018 review also, but usually it's uh, the estimates of TDM or egg to fry survival are simply reported as point estimates. And, and I think, you know, to answer the question, one of the panelists asked about, um, you know, what are we going to get out of these field studies? And I think increasing the, the resolution of these predictions and reducing that uncertainty is going to prevent decision makers from having unwarranted confidence in their water management decisions. And, uh, you know, Brad touched on 2022, but that was a time in which, you know, the NIMS model predicted that with the temperature management scenario uh, that occurred, that there would be 20% egg to fry survival, and it was the lowest on record, less than 2%. So if, if that's the tool we're using to make decisions, I think if we incorporated all the uncertainty uh, that exists there, you would actually have seen that there was very little difference between the management decisions. Uh, and that might free up some room to talk about things like flow or other uh, you know, things that might be affecting the fry life stage instead of um, the over-focus on, uh, on the temperature-dependent mortality uh, aspect. And um, kind of related to that, is I wanted to touch on uh, some folks had talked about the constriction of thermal habitat and the uh, distribution of spawning moving considerably upstream. And that was um, purported to be an effect of temperature management. And one thing is that there's a lot of data on what's happened with habitat in that reach. And I don't think habitat below any dam is usually good because of the restriction of sediment input the lack of habitat forming flows and the Sacramento River in the spawning reach for winter run is actually highly urbanized. And one thing that happened in the early 2000s is there was a, a passage impediment at ACID Dam that was resolved. And then they also started the gravel injection site at Keswick. And if you look at the red data, as soon as that happened, all of a sudden, huge fractions of the reds are now observed upstream of ACID. So there's alternate explanations besides temperature for some of these things. And I think, you know, and Eric and Brad both talked about fish spawning in that deep water habitat below Keswick because gravels are artificially injected there. And we might be creating an ecological trap there and we, we haven't even, you know, evaluated whether that gravel injection site is having the intended effect on production. So um, I, I just think there's still a lot to explore there and a lot to resolve and a, and a lot of um, studies that are needed in order to resolve um, 
some of the uncertainties we have in these models just so decision makers can have a tool that's uh, that's worthwhile. And that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is also online and uh, Thaddeus Petner, report with Policy LLC. <clears throat> Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Good, good afternoon. Uh, I just switched over to your platform so I could speak. So thank you very much. And I'll keep my comments brief since I know it's, it's been a long day for all of you. But I, I do want to just thank uh, the panel for putting this together um, for all the speakers. I think it's been uh, illustrative on, on a number of fronts. Um, I am Thaddeus Bettner. I'm here representing the Sacramento River Settlement Contractors. So we are water users. Um, they get water below Shasta in the, the Sacramento Valley. And obviously we are very interested on, you know, how Shasta is operated. And we're also very committed to seeing uh, winter run recover. Um, you know, fish are extremely important to us and and I hope that, you know, for most of the folks in the room, they, they've seen our commitment through that process in terms of projects that we've been working on. And then, you know, also just diversions. Um, the last several drought years, uh, Shasta has been solely operated for the purposes of providing flows and temperature uh, for the benefit of winter run salmon. And actually our diversions are secondary to that use. And so it's, I think it's very important to, to understand that and realize it. And so, you know, we've been committed to um, taking and using less water than potentially what's in our contract, which uh, somebody spoke of a, a little bit ago. So we have tried to be as flexible as we can work with reclamation, uh, with the science community, with the fishery biologists to understand and trying to continue to protect what's necessary for the needs of winter run. Um, just a couple of things, maybe just, to, to think about moving forward. Um, it was mentioned earlier that um, the Shasta system is a spring fed system. So all the major tributaries are spring fed. Um, so it's a little bit different when you start looking at the impacts of climate and how climate may be affecting those streams and particularly flows and temperatures. So it's a little bit different than maybe analyzing a snowmelt system. Um, that'd be one thing. And then also we're also starting to see when there's larger carryover, actually there's um, a system buffer and actually the reservoir does not get an opportunity to cool off through the winter season. So while storage and carryover may be good, you know, we may have additional thermal mass in the reservoir that may prevent the reservoir from actually cooling um, through the winter. So that'd be something that I think we want to start to look at um, as we have these new models in hand. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, just want to appreciate Reclamation for making huge strides and processes to improve the physical models for the operation of Shasta, better understanding um, how Shasta and Trinity are integrated as well as uh, temperature releases downstream. I think that will help us for both in your planning and long-term planning. So look forward to that opportunity. And then as was mentioned earlier, um, you know, just we need more help in some of our biological models and tools. And I think that investment is really necessary for now, just as we continue to protect winter run where they spawn below Shasta. And I think we fully support looking above Shasta and um, also support the winter went to tribe and seeing what can be possible in the McLeod. Um, you know, we need a couple different locations and we're very supportive of that. But I think also the science and mechanisms need to be consistent in both locations. So what we do below Shasta needs to be likely a similar monitoring and science plan that we'd have above Shasta in the, in the McLeod. And, you know, I know as meant, also mentioned earlier, I think, um, you know, if we can better inform some of our TDM models with better data, uh, more current data, most of the data that was used to build out models is now over 10 years old, uh, both on the spawner information, egg to fry survival, um, the background survival is, uh, uh, Dr. Anderson reported is also just a fixed constant that's over 10 years old and the spotter density correlations are over 10 years old. So, you know, if we were to bring in more recent data, would that in any way change or improve our understanding of the critical temperature for fish? And then to what extent does that temperature really fluctuate based on data? So um, again, we're here to support it. Um, we've been also part of a Sac River 
Sacramento River Science Plan that we have a part active partnership on. And that plan has also identified key areas of activities and studies that we need to really focus on and implement. We have not really made a big dent in those. So, you know, if the committee here would be willing to also look at that plan and make some recommendations to us as the science and water user community of what they would think would be the next thing that we should be focusing on. Um, we, we'd like to do that. And I would also say we're committed to uh, providing funding and spending our own dollars to help implement this to make sure there's no delay. So again, thank you for the time today. Um, it's, it's been great to see everybody and hear the presentations. And again, thank you for taking the time to be interested in our backyard up here. It's, it's very important and vital to us. We love our region, our rivers, our communities, um, our mountains, our tribes, and we wanna to continue to see that exist for the future. Thank you. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your assistance as this committee moves to a close. And uh, our next speaker is Glenn Spain, who is with Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations and also the Institute for Fisheries Resources. So, Glenn, you have the responsibility to ensure that the day ends on a high. Uh, Can you hear me? You will be the last speaker. So, thanks for your patience and for sticking around. Can you hear me okay? I, no, you're very quiet. Can you speak into the microphone a little clearer? I may have to adjust something here. Can you hear me uh, better now? Not very well. Let me see what I can do here. Okay, is that better? It's, it's a little better. You could speak into the mic and you're doing a great better? job in building up the, the, uh, the excitement <laughs> for the, the final call of the day. Is, is that better now? Uh, not really. Is there anything okay. you can do on the speakers here? Yeah, uh, you might. Speakers are working, but I think the problem's at the other end. Could you say, Glenn, could you say a couple of words to see if that's any better? Yes, this is Glenn Spain. I am the Northwest Regional Director for the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association and its science affiliate oh, Institute for uh, Fisheries Resources. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, if we're very quiet, please go ahead, Glenn. I'll, I'll do my best to project. Uh, there are four issues that I want to discuss and just underscore. The first is that the, there is a big elephant on the table that is mostly ignored for political reasons in California. And that is that the entire California water system, particularly in the Central Valley, is over-appropriated. Uh, uh, remarkably, it wasn't until 2014 that there was an organized effort to basically total up all of the water rights that had been issued over the last hundred years uh, by uh, the Center for water, uh, Watershed Sciences, University of California, Davis. The Grantham and Veers paper, I have supplied a copy to staff so the panelists can get it. Their conclusion was very startling. And that is that the water system of the California uh, river system has been approximately five times over appropriated. In other words, if you put all the water rights together, they total about five times the total volume of the state's mean annual runoff for all of its river systems. And in some river systems, particularly in the Sacramento and San Joaquin is up to 10 times over appropriated. That is the fundamental problem that California has to face um, and why so much water analysis is basically zero sum game. Uh, and again, I sent, sent a copy of that paper for your, uh, your review. The second thing is that we are a victim of single species management. The winter run has been listed for a while. Now the spring run is uh, Chinook are listed, but the fall run is not listed and gets very little attention. There's no hatchery genetics management plan for fall run. There is very little monitoring. The kind of models that we uh, deal with don't take into account a lot of the fall run uh, uh, characteristics. What we need is a firm recommendation from your panel that this be an ecosystem approach, not just single species approach. Uh, 
The third issue, of course, is that the water temperatures, that is the seven day average of daily maximum water temperatures that are allowed under state law, under water right uh, order 90-5, uh, uh, adopted in 1990, allow up to 56 degrees Fahrenheit or 13.3 centigrade. That is the backup, that is the standard. Uh, it is only rare exceptions that people have to fight for. That standard is so obsolete, it's more than 34 years out of date. It doesn't take into account the NIMS egg TMD model, the Martin studies, any of the studies. It doesn't uh, take into account the flow needs, et cetera, et cetera. It's a single dimension obsolete standard. So one of the recommendations that I would urge the panel to make is to recommend that that water right order 90-5 be reopened and re, um, uh, rethought in line uh, with current uh, and better available science. The fourth issue I wanna point out, and uh, one of your speakers earlier uh, said it this way, managing to a nonlinear threshold is risky, quote unquote. Forget who it said it, but the uh, 12 degree centigrade 12.0 degree centigrade threshold is a, a cliff. It is a cliff. Uh, beyond that, by just a fraction of a degree, you wind up with massive mortalities, far uh, greater than simply um, uh, linear uh, 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 or exponential uh, 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 increase. It, it increase, increases rapidly. The Most of the models do not uh, deal with the fact that there is observational error, uh, there is measuring error, there is data uncertainty. Those things, if not taken into account and provided for by a buffer zone, a, um, a precautionary buffer against decisions can push us over that cliff and have in many years. Uh, the the important thing about those is that the decisions uh, as, as to where those buffers are should be based on the best available science and on the basis of a precautionary approach. So I would urge the uh, panel to recommend a precautionary approach to all of these standards. And to make sure that the models do take into account the uncertainties. If there is uncertainty in your predictive model, that is all the more important that there be a precautionary buffer against mistakes, against the random problems of uh, daily temperature spikes, et cetera, et cetera. So those are th uh, four of the areas that I uh, would like to underscore for the panel and will uh, provide some written comments as well. Thank you. And I hope you heard most of that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Glenn, people are nodding if we picked up on that. And thank you. You didn't disappoint in the last comments of the day. Um, so with that, we've come to the end of a, a very long day. I'd just like to thank on behalf of the committee, everyone, the presenters, uh, the, the large number of folks who've made the effort to be here today, uh, and for the not inconsiderable number who's followed the meeting on, online today. I'd just like to, to reiterate uh, you know, two things. Um, we will reconvene an open session at 9.30 tomorrow uh, when we're excited to hear from the Willem Winter tribe um, just to get some deeper perspective beyond Cassandra's beautiful poem. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow morning. And uh, with that, we'll close the meeting and perhaps we could just thank all of the presenters